The following podcast is a presentation of Project Entertainment Network. Welcome to Vicious Whispers with Mark Tullius, your source for horror, sci-fi, suspense, and all things violent. Hey, what's going on, guys? Thank you so much for joining me today on Vicious Whispers with Mark Tullius. Today we have episode 69 at the end of the episode, we'll be sharing chapter 17 and chapter 18 of Ain't No Messiah. Uh, chapter 17 is a short one, so you get a little bonus. There will not be a short story from Untold Mayhem today. You just don't have the time. Uh, but I bet we'll be able to put one on next week. Uh, hopefully you guys are enjoying those short stories and the audiobook. Um, and if not, you're out of luck. Uh, today we, I'm starting a new segment on the podcast called The Great, The Good, The Okay, and The Holy Shit, This Book Is Terrible. So I will re- read a couple reviews of, uh, you know, one-star reviews. Actually, on Messiah, we don't have any one-star reviews, thank God. Uh, but the two-star reviews, three, four, and five. Uh, so just give you a little sense of what people are posting on Amazon about it. Um... So we will do that a little bit later, probably right before we get into the book. Um, There are a couple cool things that happened this week. Uh, But you know what? First, I'm going to tell you about kind of an emotional little thing that happened yesterday um, with my good friend. Uh, He's one of my best friends, known him for, shit, I don't know, 20 20 years or so, Maybe, maybe even a little bit longer. Uh, he's been on my podcast before, um, but, and he's also one of the healthiest guys I know, uh, my buddy Nato. Uh, turns out that I think it was about a week ago he got COVID, so he's in, so incredibly healthy, uh, takes care of himself. He's been very uh, vigilant about uh, being safe and staying away from people and all that, uh, but he got COVID last week. Uh, I believe it was on Wednesday. And so that alone was kind of scary. Um, but he had said that he had been doing okay. He was thinking that he was going to be fine. And then we didn't talk for a couple of days. Um, he also mentioned one of his boys got it too. So, um, so that was in my mind. I texted him on uh, 4th of July. It was kind of late. Uh, just wishing him a happy fourth, asking him if he was doing all right. Um, and I didn't hear back from him. And that's not like him. Usually I'll hear back from him um, pretty quickly. So there was no no, no word back from him. Uh, two days later, uh, on Monday, I texted him. I said, hey, you still alive? Jake and I have a bet going on. Um, and I often joke about Jake and I having bets, like whether or not he's dead uh, and stuff like that. Like Jake and I really don't joke about, uh, like make bets about whether or not someone is dead. But with Nato, we have a very sick sense of humor. And so that's one of the things. I, I mess with him a lot. Um, and uh, so, yeah, so I said, <laughs> I, I put Jake and I have a bet going on on whether or not uh, you're dead. Um but then it was later that night I got this. Uh, yo, bro, got a little wake up call, but all is okay on my end. Been in the hospital on a ventilator since Friday. Got really sick at night and went to the hospital. Got hard for me to breathe. So, yeah, so far, thank God I'm still alive. So, when I saw that, my first instinct was, I was like, um, I bet this dude's just messing with me. Um, but I was like, so I asked him if he was serious. I was like, oh, holy shit, I'm glad you're all right. I was thinking you were already in the clear. So I felt terrible already, and I got a little bit worried. Um, and he put, no, nah, it hit me hard, and now now I'm here. I'm not doing so hot. I wrote back, holy crap, I'm so sorry you're still on a ventilator. Can we do anything to help you out? Uh, and that's when he asked. He said, so you and Jake have a bet if I'm still alive. Damn, who bet on what? If I die, who wins? Uh, And that's when I told him, I was like, well, I was going to write bad news is him being alive cost me 10 bucks. Uh, But I thought that was in bad taste. Uh, And I explained, we really didn't have the bet. I was just getting a little worried. I hadn't heard from you. He put, uh, yeah, that was in bad taste. It's okay, though, uh, to laugh at the weak. (laughs) Um, And he put, I'm now 60, 40 chance of living. More more like 60% chance. Um, It was nice knowing you and the family if I don't make it. I put, 
wow, do you have anyone with you? Uh, at this point, I was pretty pretty upset. Um, I had some tears in my eyes a little bit. Um, oh, not yet. Maybe I didn't have any tears yet. Um, we put no, he said, uh, no, once they rolled me in the hospital, that's it. I didn't get to see my family until I make it out of here. I put, Jesus, I don't know what to say. Honestly, you're like a brother to me, and you're most definitely part of our family. We love you. Stay strong and call or text any time. We all love you very much. Um, and then, uh, so I was pretty upset. My wife was sitting next to me. The kids heard what was going on. Um, and, uh, you know, just just feeling awful that he, you know, he's such a good guy, a uh, great friend, and to be sick and in the hospital by yourself like that would be awful. Um, but then that asshole calls me back like 30, he lets it go for about 30 minutes before he actually calls me. And he still carries on that he's sick. And then he tells me that he was just messing with me and to teach me a lesson about not uh, making jokes about people dying. Um, so I did learn my lesson. I will no longer trust anything he tells me or texts me. Um, I should have known. I told my wife that he was messing with me, but she said no, he wouldn't mess around like that. So now she knows too. So I will still mess around about people dying. I just will no longer believe anything that Nato tells me. So that is the lesson that I learned. Um, but I was laugh laughing my ass off when he called me. And I told my wife ahead of time too. I said, you know what? He's, I was like, he's probably messing with me. I said, but if he is, it's all good. I'm fine. Like, I'm happy if he's messing with me. So I was relieved uh, when he called me and told me that. I was a little upset, but I was laughing my ass off. So... It was all good. Um, speaking of all good, we had a pretty awesome vacation this week. Um, my wife's uh, client, one of her clients, let us borrow his beach house in Newport Beach, which is right on the beach. Um, pretty amazing. We've been there a couple times before, but we haven't really done anything since all the COVID st started. Um, so we went down there. We hung out. Um the ocean was nuts. There was a huge riptide. Um, the lifeguards wouldn't let anyone in the water unless you had fins. Uh, a little bit scary. We played in a little bit, but not too much. Um, on the bad side, my daughter got incredibly sunburned. Uh, it sucks. Her hands and her eyes and her legs were incredibly burned. Uh, Jake got a little burned himself, but it wasn't too bad. Um, but it overall was pretty fun until the fireworks hit. And then that scared the hell out of everybody. Uh, it was very loud, kind of like being in a war zone. Uh, but the other nice thing about on, on 4th of July was Saturday and Sunday, the beaches were closed. And uh, But because we had access to the beach, the, the house opens up to the beach, um, all the locals were able just to walk out there. The lifeguards didn't bother us. Uh, so we got to be on a nice deserted beach for a while, which was kind of cool. Um, at night when the fireworks started, that's when the cops went by and was tell telling everyone to go inside. Uh, but yeah, so it was, it was a good little time. Um, I was a little bummed that I did not bring, uh, my brand new bass. My, uh, I got a bass guitar for my daughter, uh, let her pick it out and everything, but I also made sure it was a good one. Um, it's a Ibanez, nothing too uh great but a good first bass um turns out though that she doesn't care for the bass and would rather be playing my electric guitar um and so i'm the one that's picking it up i've been playing it uh, the last two weeks and really enjoying it uh it's a nice it, it's so much of a faster transition because i'm already okay at guitar uh playing bass is coming pretty easy uh and it's fun so Right now, I'm switching in between the two instruments, but mainly staying with uh, the bass. So we'll see how that goes. Um, another good thing that came about from going to the beach was that I had to uh, realize, man, I need to start dieting. I was not happy having my shirt off, my chub there. My son always loves grabbing my fat rolls and saying, ooh, look at the chub, ooh, look at the chub. That's one of his favorite places to grab. Um, so I was like, you know what, I do have plenty of chub, and it doesn't need to be in there. I could be in much better shape. Um, so I, as soon as I got back on Sunday, I started the intermittent fasting again. And uh, so I've been on that for the last three days. And the other big thing I did was I cut out um, the caffeine drinks I'm, I usually have. I, 
Uh, yeah, so usually I have like two yerba mates a day, and sometimes on top of that I'll have like a bang or something, one of those super unhealthy drinks. Like I don't know how bad they are for you, but I know they can't be good. So I was like, not only am I putting all this caffeine into me, um, high levels, which probably isn't the safest thing, I'm also giving my kids like a bad example of the, like I don't want them drinking that stuff. So, and with the yerba mates, those have sugar, even though it's organic, like that's extra sugar. I just don't need it. It's putting on more weight. Um, definitely not healthy. So this week, uh, the last three days, I've just been brewing my own uh, yerba mate at home. Uh, there's no sugar at all on it and um, a lot less caffeine. So I've just been doing that and feeling really good. Already dropped a good amount of weight and uh, getting back onto exercising again, alternating yoga and um yoga and swimming and our hydro the rowing machine i got away from using that it's a, it's a little bit boring but i figure i could force myself to do it once every other day um other news i'm still plugging away on try not to die in the pandemic that main story is just about finished um i have to be okay with just not having i'm not going to be working at a very fast pace i'm spending all my time with my family for the most part um, so it does make it difficult and I'm right now I'm still cleaning up uh, beyond bright side uh, that should only take me another day or two I'm just waiting on the very final chapters from my editor um, and then I can s finally send that off to uh, early readers so I'm excited about that um, another thing that's going on is I made a decision to keep this new short story the rules I'm going to uh, have that be exclusive for subscribers. So for people that have subscribed to my newsletter, um, they will be the only ones getting this short story. Uh, it is, I don't know, it may not be the best story to introduce new readers to uh, my work because it will trigger a lot of people. There's a good amount of violence and there's also some uh, violence towards animals, but whatever uh if they don't like it then that's probably a good indicator that they probably wouldn't like the rest of my stuff uh, but that story i'm hoping will be out uh next week or so it's already ready to go i just gotta put it up i also need to finish the i was designing the cover i was trying to draw it myself right now it looks like a fourth grader did it um so i'm not sure if i want to put it out or not i'll probably work on it a little bit and then as far as the narration, um, I don't know if I'm going to narrate it myself or get someone to do it professionally. That's probably what I should do. Um, but then that means a couple more steps for me. Um, I don't mind paying the money to have it done. I just don't feel like going and trying to find a narrator for a single story. But I think I might go that route. So today is the start of a new segment on the podcast where I will be reading reviews on uh, different books. Not a whole bunch of reviews. I think I'll probably do like four or five. I want to give a, uh, a broad look at the book. So we'll be going over all the reviews. I'm actually calling this The Great, The Good, The Okay, and The Holy Shit, This Book Is Terrible. Because yes, I do have some of those. Uh, fortunately, I'm Messiah. I only have, uh, there are three two-star reviews. That's the lowest that people have gone. Um, so let's go ahead and start with, we'll start with the holy shit, this book is terrible. Um, all right, this first one is from C, and it's titled One Messed Up Roller Coaster. I received this book free in exchange for an honest review. All right, so this was weird. A ton of violence and death, sex and manipulation. I get that Joshua was to be the second coming of Christ. Great but I'm so confused when it comes to certain things. Why so much sex? Who was Joshua's real mother? Where the hell did his brother go? Who was his dad? Honestly, I thought about giving up 34% of the way through the book, but decided to see it through. I'm not happy with the way it ended and more than likely won't be picking up the second one anytime soon. All right, cool, I get it. Uh, thank you C for sharing that. So that was one of the worst reviews. Um, I gotta keep this honest. All right, let's go to an okay review. Actually, I think three stars might be, I like the book. Um, and then four might be, it's really good. And five might be great, but whatever. In my mind, three stars is, it's okay. All right, this one is from JT. Uh, he said, interesting enough, but not a rereader. 
this was interesting. Joshua, born dead, revives just before being buried, and after his father cries out, promises to God to spread his word if his son is spared. He takes this to mean Josh Joshua is the second Messiah and is so single-minded in his desire to grow a church around this belief that he terrorizes his family into a cult-like living. Fed up, Joshua tries to leave and is continually pulled back into his father's clutches despite all Joshua does to try to prove he's not the Messiah. Some parts were hard to read due to my own hang-ups on sex and violence. Overall, though, it was interesting enough to finish, but I confess I'm glad it's not longer. All right, thank you, JT. That's pretty fair, and especially the part about his own hang-ups about sex and violence. Um, I have some of those, but I try to power through them. Um, let's see. All right, here we go. Let's do a good review. This is someone that liked it, gave it four stars. All right, this is from C. Hunter. Uh, she wrote, the title was Not What I Thought. Um, I'm not even sure what I thought I was getting into when I started this book. It's a pretty intense read. Readers do need to be aware that there are sexual situations, violence, and profanity. Abuse is abuse. Readers, uh, let's see, whether it's physical, mental, or emotional, it's all nasty. It's long-lasting and leaves an imprint that colors everything a victim thinks, feels, and does all the rest of their life. The life of this young man leads us, leads is the product of what his parents did to him. What might his life been like if he had been raised as a normal child? This is a deeply disturbing story, but strangely enticing. Once you start it, it's very difficult to set it aside. And what's awesome about that is, I mean, that was the whole point of the book. Uh, so I'm really glad that she got that. Um, it goes on. I'm not even sure what I thought I was getting into. Oh, so it was just a... It, recopied it okay so that was her review uh she got that re review uh she got a copy of the book free through voracious readers um and it was a honest review so that was awesome i'm glad that she got that thank you c hunter for that and now let's go to a really good one what no one liked it no i just didn't print that damn page uh let's see where hmm there was a really good one i wanted to read and oh here it is all right let's go out on a great one um all right five stars uh joshua has been appointed to sacrifice for us all but he just wants to live a normal life all right here we go this is from hessen reverend charles campbell and millions of followers of the church of the second son swear that his son joshua declared dead at birth and survivor of multiple encounters with death is the messiah who has come to judge the living and the dead to redeem them with his death and to send all the infidels to hell. Joshua insists immovably that he is not so and tries to depart as much as he can from the fanaticism of his father and his brother Paul, although the circumstances shall reunite their lives on more than one occasion. His childhood neighbor and lifelong friend, filmmaker Jeremy, will be in charge of showing him the world, documenting most of his life and opening his eyes to the truth that seemed incredible. The beginning of the book, which brings us close to the final minutes, <clears throat> which brings us close to the final minutes to then go back and take the sections that shape the plot is intriguing and very promising. And for 24 chapters dedicated to those with the courage to question everything they believe uh, with a pretty good narrative rhythm and a bulletproof protagonist, this story, which promises part two, offers an exciting plot full of violent events, family ruptures, and dirty secrets that will involve an entire nation and that perfectly fulfill the promise made at the beginning. The protagonist, Josh for friends, tries to shake off the guilt inoculated by a fanatical and castrating father who forces him to pray to another father with whom he also does not count for anything positive, while insisting that due to his lack of faith and action, Joshua is to blame for each and every one of the misfortunes and evils of this world. The premise is interesting in itself and the main character grows in a reactionary but very logical way in the face of such impositions on a rough journey through which he, <clears throat> on a rough journey through which he tries to shake off the enormous burden of his fame in a world full of cameras, accusatory fingers, and its social networks, which, like his father, do not forgive or forget. This is an excellent novel that puts its finger right on the stigmata and proposes a possible not-so-distant future in which the disenchanted masses eager for divine answers are more than willing to sacrifice again an appointed man for the sake of their own salvation. Awesome. Thank you so much, Hessen. That is an incredible review. Um, yeah, going to be happy with it. So that is a little bit about Eight No Messiah. That's what readers and listeners are saying. Um, I'll go over a couple more of those uh, next week as well. 
Uh, I'd like to hear what you guys think. Hopefully you're enjoying it. Feel free to save your comments until it's finished. And uh, yeah, we'll just go from there. So let us finish now. Uh, we'll go out on chapter 17 and 18 of Ain't No Messiah. And I will speak to you guys next week. Later. Chapter 17 Jeremy and Paul working together one last time. Funny how stuff works out. The odds of all of us being back together for this one point in life are fucking finale. Paul's perfect face in the empty lobby filled the screen. Him and Jeremy the only people in it. I still don't have the volume on because I don't want to hear what he says. I don't want to think about what he's promising, who he's praising. How there's no better way to unveil our sacred inner city than with the second son of God finally being baptized or buried, depending on the vote. Plus, I, I've gotten used to the quiet, the soft chant of 316 humming through the glass. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ must die again. Catchy. I even find myself singing along. All that's left of the sun is the mountain's golden rayed halo. I'm sure some would say it's beautiful, but it's of no concern. It's 610, 20 minutes before the polls close. The pain's not bad, but I wash down another pill, flip to the private feed streaming from our camera two blocks down, the perfect angle to capture all 47 stories. I wave my hand back and forth, pretend the tiny figure on the screen is Lily waving back. Everyone down there just went nuts. Thought the wave was meant for them. I feel foolish for a second, but I'm not the one worshipping the dummy who couldn't reach junior high. I put my hands by my sides, although what I want to do is flip all these motherfuckers off. Father would most certainly frown on that type of behavior, though. It's too early to cast any kind of judgment. The light show won't begin until the sun has set. A one shot to ingrain this moment in everyone's mind. Jeremy waited his entire life to produce this masterpiece of film half the world would witness. I told him I didn't need to see it ahead of time. I trust him completely. I hadn't noticed it before, but the slightest hint of electric red flame is licking the bottom two stories. The 44 stories above, smoldering black. All except the cross, outlined blood red. The closer we get to beginning, the less nervous I am. The more right this all feels. Jammy's video is all pre-recorded. Nothing for me to do but watch. But I will fulfill my part of the deal. I'm ready to address the masses. I want the world to hear what I say. Jeremy originally suggested we sell the special. Said we could make millions. I refused and insisted it be free. No one should have to pay to hear another man's thoughts. Plus, now everyone will know this hasn't been altered, condensed, or censored. I can only imagine what version the mainstream would deliver if we sold it. Back on Channel One, Paul is standing inside the front doors, head bowed in prayer. The camera leaves Paul and heads outside. Choi is watching over the red carpet, my special guest seated in front of him. Jeremy walks past Paul and pans through the crowd, everyone pushing and screaming for their 15 seconds. Over the earpiece, Jeremy says, You ready to do this? The word flows naturally, no delay, with my scrambled brain speaking straight from the heart. Absolutely. Then turn to channel two, Jeremy said. Let the show begin. I do it and turn up the volume, the rumble of the crowd, nearly as loud as the assholes chanting 316. The screen looks the same until the flames start rising, creeping up the front of the building, burning brighter as they ascend. The clear cross sparkling into a blinding white, the pyramid blacked out except for my box. I radio Troy. Let's bring everyone up. Affirmative, Jeremy says. Back to channel one. He'd walked to the edge of the lake and turned around so he could capture all seven buildings, each of them with the white diamond cross 
the fire flicking behind it. The electricity running through the crosses is nothing compared to the frenzied screams, the mass of flesh. My people, chanting Charles 316, the people had spoken. I don't need to look at the next channel to know what they're saying. Not even Jeremy can see Channel 3, live results from the vote. There are two columns, a staggering blue yes on the left, a tiny speck of red no on the right. 97% of the votes siding with Father's most famous passage. It's pretty much been official since it got underway. I knew it'd be lopsided, but nothing like this. It makes sense, though. It's not just believers who think I must die. Every religion, every liberal, anyone out there whose power I threaten. That country's in chaos. The world a fucking mess. But it's nice to see everyone taking the time to give their figurative two cents at the cost of 99 real ones. This next screen is where it gets interesting. Well, I see how much those two cents are adding up. The fine print is the reason why the dollar amount on the right is so much higher than the one on the left. I learned from Jeremy the smart way to make money. Let people pay for something they want. I let people vote as many times as they liked. I figured he'd tip the odds against me, since I couldn't picture someone liking me enough to vote over and over. I can't wait for all the haters to see their bill, realizing they should have read the fine print each repeated call costing twice that of the previous. It's hard for me to even say what the dollar amount is. Only partly because it's got all those zeros. In another 15 minutes, I'll be one of the richest men in the world. And I got nothing but a world wishing me dead. Chapter 18 The lights were low. Nothing in the room but a woman in white standing in front of a brown cabinet, a closed door beside her. Everything was fuzzy, no way to know if I was still stuck in the dream I couldn't pull out of. Snippets of being surrounded by people, a voice telling everyone, Make way for the Messiah. The woman in white had dark brown hair halfway down her back and a snug nurse's outfit with a short skirt, not like the prison get-ups they wore at County. I figured there must have been a complication, a reaction to the medicine. When I cleared my throat to ask where I was, the woman jumped, fiddled with the black handbag on top of the cabinet before turning around. The nurse looked so familiar, her face and lips delicate like Jeremy's used to be. Danielle? It had to be a dream, but I still asked. Is this real? She eased onto the bed, scooted back so only a thin white sheet separated our hips. Hey there, I, I, I didn't think you'd recognize me. Of course I would. Danielle rested her hand on my bare chest, the warmth radiating from her fingers. Ah, she said, drawing it out. You're still so sweet. The grogginess was wearing off, but I wanted proof it wasn't a dream. When did you move to L.A.? Shush, honey, you just rest. Her hand moved from my chest along the better side of my face, felt the dent in my forehead. I asked, What they had me on? We gotta cut it down, it's hard to think. It's whatever the doctor prescribed. Daniel's hand went back to my chest. We all just want you to feel better. Well, I feel sick. Close your eyes and rest. Her hand inched down my stomach. Get your strength back. The upper half of me felt like puking, but my lower half had jumped to attention and was ready for action. Trying not to be obvious, I moved my bundled hand over my belly button, covered the opening where my sweatpants and underwear had risen off my flesh. Danielle's hand that wasn't on me took hold of my arm and set up by my side the voice of an angel, the girl always offering to help, said, Don't worry. Her hand kept creeping past my waistband, wrapped around me, and gave a tight squeeze. You've obviously nothing in the world to be embarrassed about, especially not this. I peeked and watched her pull my sweats down and stand me straight up. Back to believing it had to be a dream, but still worried someone would walk in. I nodded at the door behind her. She started with the slowest stroke, up, then down, up, then down. It's okay, she whispered. It's locked. 
With Beth, it had always been straight sex, just like the pornos, but never like this. I wanted so much to touch Danielle, but just covered my face because my hands were useless. Danielle stopped everything. No, I need to see you. I slid my hands to each side of my head, pressed them into the pillow. Danielle said that was better and picked up where she'd stopped, asking if it was okay. This was only the second time she'd laid her hands on me. What she was doing now made up for all the times we'd never touched. I grunted. Fuck yeah. She smiled. Good. I want to watch you come. As incredible as it felt, I couldn't hold back and pump my hips, blasted a batch of sperm all over my stomach and the sheet, a moat around her grip. Danielle shushed me and said, Just hold still. Gave me three slow pumps, milking out the last drops. She cupped my seed, careful not to drop it, and backed up to the foot of the bed. I was ready to close my eyes, afraid she was going to gobble it down like the skanks in the movies, but instead she wiped it off on a white hand towel. I said, holy shit, that was amazing. She came back with the towel and cleaned me up, dabbed the sheet. You feel much better. Much. Danielle slid my sweats back up and gave me one last squeeze. Good, that's real good. She grabbed her purse and set the hand towel inside, told me to get some rest. With her hand on the doorknob, she said, And Joshua, please don't ever tell anyone about this. I could lose everything. I could barely keep my eyes open, but I promised I wouldn't tell a soul. The creak of the door woke me, my name called out by another voice I hadn't heard in it forever. So, the prodigal son returns. Paul had grown quite a bit in the seven years since we'd squared off. It was like looking at a younger version of father. Black suit, combed hair, dark eyes. Paul's nose was the exception, still leaning left, thanks to Dusty. There were so many things I could have said, but I kept replaying the words I'd at last spat at him. From the footboard, Paul asked, Is it okay if I sit down? I said, sure. Propped myself up on my elbows. Paul sat in the folding chair beside the bed on the wrong side of my face. The way he was sizing me up didn't match his tone of voice. How are you feeling? It felt like I was in the twilight zone because I was looking out the door at our old hallway. The photo father took when they pulled the branch out of me hanging on the wall. Where am I? Paul looked shocked. Really? This room was smaller than the one we'd shared as kids but smelled just like it. This used to be father's office. I wanted to cry, yell, scream, but all that came out was a whimper. Why am I here? Paul waited until I looked at him. Another trick from father's playbook. He had also adopted the scary stare that said not to test him. Trust me, I didn't vote for it. Why'd Jeremy let him take me? This is kidnapping. Paul shushed me. Relax. They both did what they thought was best for you. I slammed my hand on the mattress, welcomed the pain. What about my job, my car? It was all my fucking money. I'm sure father will take care of everything. Things aren't like before. He looked at me like I was nothing. We were about to skyrocket with or without you. Then why am I here? Because you're the Messiah, like it or not. Don't even start with that shit. Then why are you here? How many times do you have to survive near death to see that for some reason you're special? I knew he wasn't looking for an answer, but I'd given a lot of thought to that one. Probably three or four more, depends on how severe. He shook his head. You'll never change. And to what? What do you want me to become? This is pointless. I don't want to be here. It's not all bad, he said like it was a fact. Now is it? My mind flashed a memory of Danielle and the hand job. You hired her? Would you rather have had someone else? Is he here? Father? No, he's at the church, but we'll be back soon. So what now? What do you want? Will you see Mother? If she wants to see me, she can come in here. Paul shook his head. No, she can't. I'd forgotten Father had said she was sick, probably because I knew better than to believe anything he'd said. How bad is she? Come on. Paul got up, his voice back to the little kid. Mother's precious angel, let me help you. 
When he reached for my forearm, I pulled it back, told him I could do it myself. I swung my legs off the bed and followed him into the hallway. Instead of turning right, I went left, shouldered upon my bedroom door. The bottom bunk remained, the rest of the room transformed into an office. The stack of Stephen King books beside the desk, the green chalkboard with Charles 316 written in white. Paul asked what I was doing. You don't mind sharing the room with him? He said, that's father's room. I've got a place in town. I didn't bother closing the door. They let you leave? They knew they could trust me, he grabbed the knob, that I would never abandon them again. The hallway smelled like Lysol, just like the offices old and new. What about the bakery? That's over. You don't miss it? We both knew I was stalling. Paul opened the door and said, I meant for much bigger things than that. The TV was on and facing the bed, my old friend. They'd shown me what I was guilty of, all the death, dismemberment, disease. This was the source of the Lysol, but in here it placed second to a riper smell of decay. It wasn't the geraniums in the window box because there was nothing but dirt and some weeds. The closer I got to the bed, the more obvious what it was. Mother, so thin, pale, matchsticks poking out of her hospital gown, tubes running in and out of her. Her eyes never left the screen. Some game show with contestants guessing prices. The sound so low I couldn't make anything out. I was nearly to the bed when Paul closed the door and made her look over. The eyes that had chastised, criticized, and always been filled with despair were now cloudy. She opened her mouth, her cracked lips making me look away. Oh, Joshua. She paused for a breath. I can't believe you came. She said her voice barely above a whisper. You wanted me to? The strongest face I'd ever known cracked, then crumbled. So much pain in those eyes. I'm so sorry. It didn't make sense, but I came closer, stood beside the bed. I shushed her the way she used to do with me before she got mean. Everything's okay. She kept saying sorry over and over, tears flowing down her cheeks. We left you a choice. I wondered if apologies was something everyone did before they died. I'd never seen anyone that knew 100% that their life was nearly over. Dusty never saw it coming. Bull knew he was fucked up, but was still praying for a miracle. Same with the banker Lucas dropped. But the mother, there was no denying anything. Even I was smart enough to know there wasn't a cure for her kind of sick. Doing my best to keep her calm, I got down on my knees, made it so we were practically face to face. I must have winced because Mother cried even harder, started choking. I yelled for Paul to help, but all he did was come in and increase her IV drip. There was nothing else we could do, he said. He suggested I pray with her. Mother had it together by the time Paul closed the door behind him. I asked her if she wanted me to say a prayer. I'll do it if you think it'll help. No. Her hand shook when she raised it, purple and black bruises up and down her forearm. She placed a palm on the palm print on my face. How much did she tell you? Danielle? No, but you stay away from that family. I'm a grown man. I'm sorry. Her hand went back to the bed. She took an extra breath to recover, the simple movement taxing her. What did Laura say? How much do you know? It seemed like a strange time to start crying, but my tears were falling. I think I know it all, and then I think I know nothing. I never should have allowed it, she said. It's what I get. Is there anything you want to tell me? That I'm sorry I didn't treat you better. That I didn't treat you like my son. Even if it wasn't completely true, I said, it's not your fault. She didn't deny it, almost seemed to lighten up upon hearing it. He would have left me. I gave him you, so he wouldn't. I gave him a messiah to consume our lives. Mother held up a finger while she caught her breath. Joshua, if you are him, if you are the messiah, there is only one thing I will ask. I hated that I'd become a tiny little boy anxious to please, but I said, anything 
and actually meant it. She had to look away when she asked, Can you forgive me? As the Messiah, she brought her eyes back. No, honey. I need to be forgiven by you. I used my teeth to take off the tape on my left hand and unravel the gauze. I undid my right and took mother's hand between both of mine, new flesh and old. I said, I forgive you for any and all wrongdoing. I hold you accountable for nothing. The smallest smile crept from her lips and she whispered, thank you. She locked eyes so I knew she was serious. And one more thing. If you're him, if you are the Messiah, if I can, I will. Send that awful man to hell. Make him burn for me, for you, for Polly, for all the people listening to his lies, for all the ones he's going to destroy. Paul was waiting in the hallway, not five feet from the door. I walked past him and headed for the kitchen. He followed and said, What'd she say? Anything you didn't overhear wasn't meant for you. Paul's grasp was as fake as the rest of his act. From the church on the other side of the wall, Father said, Joshua, please come here. I had something to say to him, and it had nothing to do with him finally saying, Please. I told Paul to open the laundry door because of my hands. He did what I asked, but when I was walking by, he said, I hope you will pray for her. The passage was so small I had to walk sideways. I went through the curtain, stepped to the side so Paul could join Father down on his knees in the first pew, a cushion taking all the fun out of it. Father asked, Will you pray with us? I stayed where I was, hand on the pulpit. And what are you praying for? Your mother, of course. What I said was the truth, but I didn't say it to make him happy. I am praying for her. Neither of them said a word, but I knew what they were thinking. I said, you think I want her to die? Maybe I'm judging her. Paul shook his head, and Father took a few seconds getting to his feet, said I couldn't be Father from the truth. So is my praying no good then? I don't know how to fucking pray. Paul eased back in the pew only a couple of feet from where we'd all fought our last night together. Father said something, but I wasn't stopping. Am I not doing it loud enough? Am I not calling him by the right name? Father stood as tall as he could, but still came up short. He tried making up for it with his booming voice. How dare you? I did dare because life had thrown every fucked up thing it could at me, and I was still going. If there's a God and he gave one shit about me, she'd be walking right now. And she'd be gathering all her shit and getting the fuck out of here. Away from you two. Father said, you can't. I shouted, no. I couldn't see my eyes, but they must have read murder. Both of theirs most definitely read fear. You wasted her life on a lie. Forced your failures on her. Don't ever tell me different. My church is not a failure, Father pulled out his phone, pressed a button, and shoved the screen at me. Nearly 300,000 followers, 100,000 podcast subscribers, a packed church, and one of Amazon's top books on religion. And you can't afford a hospital. This is what she wanted. I snatched the phone out of his hand and threw it through the stained glass window, the pain in my palm clearing my mind. Father chewed his tongue, looked like he'd draw blood. You're going to pay for that. Give me my money and I'll happily pay you and get the hell out of here. I don't have your money. I couldn't speak for a second. I had to swallow first. Then where is it? How could you have left all my money? I didn't know anything about any money. You kidnapped me. Father became calm. Are you going to report me? I'm sure Willie would be happy to come arrest me for rescuing my son. From what? Yourself. I'll call the state police. Why don't you sleep on it? You can tell everything to Officer Harrow's at tomorrow's service. This is bullshit. Well, ask him. Which one has a higher conviction rate? Rescuing an injured loved one or destroying religious artifacts? I said I'd pay for it. They have laws against that now. Probably label it a hate crime. 
I tried not getting all flustered. You can't have a hate crime against yourself, Polly said. Suicide. I snapped. Stay out of this, Father said. Stop it. The point is, you're not going to say a word. You're also not about to abandon your mother. I wasn't going to win the battle, especially when I couldn't think straight. I'll stay as long as she needs me, but not a day longer in this house. It's not good for anyone. Prepared as always, Father didn't miss a beat. Paul's already placed an air mattress in the barn. We'll talk about an apartment depending on how things go. What does that mean? It means we need to see if you're going to play ball. I want my car. I want my money. Your car will be here in two days. If you want money, you're going to have to earn it. It was six weeks later, five weeks since Mother died gasping for air. I was in the small sauna of a sacristy. The church of his son was on the outskirts of town and had to be over a hundred years old, well before air conditioning was invented. Danielle raised the narrow window, but the outside air did nothing to keep the sweat from rolling down my forehead. She grabbed a stack of pamphlets from the counter and waved me down, dabbed the drops with her handkerchief. You're going to be brilliant. I just don't want to embarrass you. I tried not to lie to Danielle and added, or myself, well, I'll be in here, so no worries there. Even if Father hadn't forbidden me from being seen with any females, Danielle had said she wouldn't let anyone catch her inside the building. It was a small town, and rumors spread quick. I figured it was her mother she was worried about, the reason Danielle only stayed a couple of nights in the barn with me. I kissed her forehead and thanked her for encouraging me to do this. She smiled and said, of course, I wouldn't miss it. I know I'd already asked her a few times, but the cloak was super bulky and kept shifting on me. Do I look okay? Danielle pinched the heavy black material from each of my shoulders, lifted it up and let it fall. She smoothed out the front and told me to spin around her hand running down the flames embroidered on the back. Honestly? Of course. It's kind of badass. It's almost like you're the leader of a motorcycle gang. I thanked Danielle and asked her to turn on the computer monitor so I wouldn't get my sweaty prints on it. Some of what Father and Paul had been preaching had filtered through the heavy curtains separating our room from their stage, but I hadn't been paying attention. With the TV on, I saw we had less than five minutes before what Father was promoting as my glorious return. I was staring at the crowd, every seat taken, a line of people standing on either side of the outside aisles, 400 plus. Danielle jammed her finger at the bottom of the screen. Holy shit, Josh, look how many viewers. All those zeros couldn't be real but I guessed Father hadn't been exaggerating. My voice cracked when I said, Let's see how many come back next week. Danielle's eyes were glued to the ticking number, but even if it were a quarter, her voice trailed off. The camera shifted from the crowd to Father behind the pulpit, a metal monster with the flaming second sun embossed on the front, one of Jeremy's newly installed floor lights sparkling off it. Danielle said, Almost time. You ready? I wasn't so sure, but pretended I was. She kissed my forehead and wished me good luck. I said thanks and took my place in front of the curtain, rolled the satin between my fingers, wondered where Beth was, if maybe she was watching on TV. Father had always read the sermon, saving the readings for Paul and trusted readers, but today was special, he said. This is a historic mass, the glorious return of the Messiah. The thundering applause rippled the curtain. Father waited until it died down. And today he will read a section from his first audiobook single, The Descent into Darkness. Ladies and gentlemen, I give you Joshua, the second son. Danielle patted my back and said, That's your cue. I walked past the curtain, careful not to mess up my hair. Jeremy was crouched at the edge of the hallway, all professional in his black suit his camera zooming in for my close-up, getting the palm side. Father instructed to always take advantage of stigmata. I hadn't been happy Jeremy was working for the church, but he'd said he really didn't have a choice. It was the best move for both of us, really, the only one we had. And even though I didn't totally believe him about my stash, I chalked it up to another misfortune. The shitty luck of the Messiah. Instead of knocking Jeremy over with a knee, 
I smiled at him and glided on stage. Another blast of cheers, a wave of people rising in my peripheral. While I took my place, Father got on the mic about putting away cell phones, threatened ushers would confiscate all electronic devices. He reminded them where they could buy the recording. My hearing grew fuzzy and I feared the worst, but focused on my breathing. Kept my eyes on the prize, the two pieces of tape stuck to the carpet directly in front of the cross. I faced the cross, made sure each strip of tape was barely visible past my big toe, then raised my arms in a T, keeping my back to the congregation. The overhead lights flicked off, and one of Jeremy's switched on, my arms casting the perfect silhouette. A red flickering light outlined the blackened cross, and the speakers crackled. My pre-recorded voice boomed from above, behind all around. This is a reading from the Lost Gospels. As much as I hated my voice, I'd let Jeremy convince me it was perfect, the right bit of roughness for the dark tale. I'd been doing daily recordings for Paul, mainly stupid spiritual sayings and other things that had been said much better by thousands of others. But they needed content, and it was already written, so all I had to do was show up and record. We were down to it, only taking five or six takes per minute long segment, Jeremy insisting we could lower the number. This recording described Jesus' descent into hell. I held my arms perfectly still, kept my visible crown of thorns reaching for heaven, my butt and legs unclenched so I wouldn't faint and fall flat on my face. There was too much riding on this. If I could do my bit, I'd be getting my own furnished apartment. They hadn't let me hear the final cut because they knew I'd want changes, maybe scrap the whole thing. But what I was hearing sounded pretty good, especially with the sound effects and music Jeremy laid underneath. A demon twice his size landed before Jesus, knocking him into his knees. My voice deep and dark as night, just like Jeremy taught me. It said, I am Astaroth. You do well to bow before me. While in the story, Jesus said never and rose to his feet. I was thinking how most men would have already lowered their arms or been shaken like a leaf. I've been practicing, though, and was determined to show everyone that I was not most men. Astaroth grabbed Jesus by his throat and pinned him to the rocks. The grand demon came closer and snorted a spray of pus and bile, pestilence and disease. His voice was a river of razor blades and he had the breath of a thousand dead babies. Are you lost, little boy? Jesus did not tremble. He did not shake. He remembered who he was and wiped the filth from his face. He looked the demon in the squirming balls of maggots it had for eyes. I have come for my brothers, for those that should not be here. My shoulders began to tingle, so I focused on my breath and the story. The demon laughed and took Jesus like a rag doll, rushed him to the center of hell, the lake of fire licking their feet. In front of them was the man Jesus had searched for, a man he'd walk the earth with. Jesus shouted, James, you should not be here. But James was suspended in the air, dangling by his intestines, the heat melting his skin, demons on either side. James screamed, No, I believe! But it was too late. The demons too strong. The demons dug their talons deep into the flesh of James's forearms and pinned his arms back. And when the demons reached toward his eyes, James yelled, No, no, for I will not be able to see. The demons laughed as they plucked out the eyes that could not see and ripped off the ears which could not hear. Both my shoulders were burning. The slightest shake as I drew in strength. I'd recorded the story so many times, I I knew there couldn't be much left. Astaroth tired of the show and fled him away. Jesus watching as James' intestines slowly stretched inch by inch for all eternity, praying for the drop that would never come, the end that would never be. Father stood and walked toward the pulpit. Under his breath, he whispered, Great job, son. I didn't want his praise and hated how good it felt. I lowered my arms when Father said, This is the word of the Lord. Bow your heads and pray. Father said, Thank you, brothers and sisters, for joining us on this glorious day and praising his name. As we can see from today's reading, it is not enough to attend church and say we believe. 
James was a good man, a friend of Jesus, almost like a brother. But he also had his doubts, and that is all it takes. He cleared his throat, which reminded me I'd missed my cue to leave. I headed for the sacristy and stepped past the curtain as Father continued his talk. For those of you who have enjoyed the story and would like to hear the rest of the tale, you can now purchase the audiobook on all retail sites and will soon have a version up on YouTube. Danielle jumped into my arms, wrapped herself around me. You were incredible. She pointed at the monitor and said, Look. The congregation was standing, although Father hadn't asked them to. Danielle's had said, The views have nearly doubled. I still couldn't believe I had made it. To think all those people were cheering for me was too much. I pulled up the bottom of my cloak and asked Danielle to help me disrobe and grab me some water. The ceremony ended five minutes later, and a few minutes after that, Father parted the curtain, led an older white guy in a tan suit, a smile too perfect to trust. Father put his arm around the man's shoulder and walked him in front of me, Danielle by my side. I knew the guy was important because Jeremy was right there, capturing the whole handshake, and Father never got that close to anyone. Father turned to Danielle. Please wait outside for us. Danielle looked to me, and I was thinking of what to say when Jeremy chimed in. Yeah, you better go check on Mom. Danielle made a point to bump his shoulder on her way out. You're such a jerk. Father, the king of redirection, raised his voice and clapped my back. Joshua, it is my absolute pleasure to introduce to you the Honorable Senator Burkhart. Senator Burkhart, this is my son, Joshua Campbell, the Messiah. The old man squeezed my hand harder than I'd expected. I'm honored to meet you, Joshua. I believe you just might be the man who saves the world. Father probably knew I couldn't respond, so he said, No, just might about it. Joshua's the second coming. He'll help you achieve every one of your goals. In fact, why don't you let Joshua and Jeremy take you out tonight? You can see how we treat our friends this far south. They'll pick you up from your hotel at seven. This has been a presentation of the Project Entertainment Network.